Thank you so much for joining Dental Marketing Theory, a podcast by Gary Bird. In today's episode, Gary talks with the Emmett Scott. Emmett is an entrepreneur, the president of the Association of Dental Support Organization, CEO and co-founder of Community Dental Partners, executive and partner at Dentist Entrepreneur Organization, and he even has a podcast you may have heard, DSO Secrets. Tune in and enjoy. As always, please make sure to like, subscribe, share, and leave a comment, as all of those things really help to get the word out about dental marketing theory. Hope you enjoy today's show. All right, Emmett, we are live. Thanks so much for coming on. I got to tell you, this is like, for me, a pivotal moment in my career, because when I first started listening to your content, I said, and this guy knows everything about business. He knows everything about the dental industry from a non-clinician side, right? And then um, he knows everything. He's like passionate about marketing and technology and all these kind of things. And I said, someday I want to like talk to him. And obviously I've gotten to interact with you a lot, but having you on my podcast, big deal for me. So thank you so much for making my dreams come true. Well, thank you. That's a, that's a big pedestal. Now I got to live up to it and actually bring some good content here for everybody. So <laughs> thank you for having me on, Gary. Absolutely. Well, let's just start. I want to start off with, I know your background. I've gotten bits and pieces of it because it's it's floating out there, but I would love to, for you to kind of share your story about how you started off in the entrepreneur world and then came up through that to get to dentistry. Sure. I actually started in financial planning. I was doing investments for people. And then what I noticed was the entrepreneurs had the most complexity. And what I was wondering was why were they coming to me to invest in other people's businesses in the stock market and not growing their own? And what I realized was entrepreneurs hit a ceiling where they have to move from entrepreneur to executive team. They have mm -hmm. a hub and spoke system in place. They're the smartest one in the room. They don't know how to download all this intuition. And so eventually I started a radio show around this mm -hmm. and started an advisory firm um, just to move from entrepreneur to executive. Now that's just one part of, and I'll just do a little plug here for the book, but DSO Secrets, one of the chapters is just around how do you move from entrepreneur to executive and go through the dark tunnel. And we can talk a little bit about that, but that's not unique to dentistry. That's entrepreneurship. And there's so many books out there about being an entrepreneur, but for most clinicians, like once they get going and they get multiple locations, that entrepreneurship just is kind of thrust upon them. What they don't know how to do is get to the next executive level. Anyway, what ended up happening, my best friend from the age of two gives me the call, says he wants to open a dental practice, uh, said, yeah, I'm happy to help you. Didn't know what a DSO or any of those things were. It's just helping my best friend out. Frankly, that's still how I think about a DSO is just helping your best friend out. And um, you know, now we're supporting over 70 locations. I'm president of ADSO, partners in the Dentist Entrepreneur Organization, um, and and wrote a book, have a podcast called DSO Secrets. So yeah, I'm way more into this than I was planning with. <laughs> this is what happens when you help your best friend out, right? As you yep. get fully into it. And I've just gotten passionate about how do we help dentists and their teams have as big an impact as they possibly can? And, and how do you help them know if, you know, they're doing something wrong or it's just part of the journey. Yeah. Um, I love so. that. And you can tell why I look up to him because he just hit financial entrepreneurship. He hit the clinical side and then he hit the infrastructure side all in just like a couple sentences. So one of the, one of the things that I like is that you usually help people build out these mental models to kind of work through things. And one of the one, one of the mental models that you presented that really helped me was you said, when I came into the dental industry, it was like I was coming in to build houses as a contractor, but there was no Lowe's or Home Depot. Kind of walk through that experience. Yeah, I remember. So I, I think of marketing and sales as the breath of life for mm -hmm. any business, right? If you think about it, you don't need operations. You don't need accounting if you don't have any customers. Mm -hmm. So figuring out how to get patients in the door and do it really well was my primary focus. Mm -hmm. So when Dr. Evans said, I want to focus on pediatric patients, we built the whole um, practice like a storybook. They get gold coins along the way. Mm -hmm. They're part of a story. They get crowned at the end for their bravery and dentistry. 
I, I knew I needed to like solve that because if you have a bunch of customers in the door, then it becomes operational in nature. What I didn't appreciate, Gary, is the first time I went to run an AR report because we had a thousand first visits in the first three weeks. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I just need to figure out like this insurance thing and yep. who owes us what and so forth. The software took 13 hours to run the report. It wasn't because I was running off of like a 1995 Windows Mac machine, you know, Windows machine or something. It was because that's how the best software out there took 13 hours to run an AR report. And it only did it by patient name. So when I said, hey, could we sort this? I think it was like 90 days in. Could we sort it by like, what's 30 days, 60 days? Could we do like aging? Could I do it by insurance type? You know, my implementer for this software said, no, Emma, it only comes out like this. Yep. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, so if I want to run it again, like we're 13 hours again, yeah, we better do it at night because it could take down the system. <laughs> and I'm, so I'm like, holy smoke. It just hit me like a ton of bricks that I was going to be invest. Like I, at, at first, Gary, I thought, okay, something's wrong. Like they don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. I switched practice management softwares three mm -hmm. times in the first nine months, you know, talk wow. about driving your team nuts. Yeah. But I was like hunting for the homes and Lowe's solution of like, yep. there has to be an enterprise solution to at least run an AR report effectively. Yeah. And that's just for one thing you're trying to solve, right? There's one then there's simple. thing after thing, after thing, after thing, after thing. And you could go into every category of your business and you could, you run into the same problem. And that's, I think that's, you know, what, creates the opportunity that we see before us though, right? Is that there's, there's so many opportunities to solve those kind of problems. I know one of the things that you've gotten really honed in on, and I know it's a hot button topic for everybody is, um, around culture, like the, the, and, and, and getting behind like the why you're doing this. Um, and so you shared up front, you're doing this to help your friend. And that's how you look at it. And I love that mindset of, from a DSO standpoint, but now you're knee deep in it and you're seeing all these problems. So why do you continue to do it? Well, let's sit on the culture piece for a minute. I, I think there's kind of extremes out there. There's those who think of culture as like nap times and bring your dog to work and all of those things. <laughs> and then there's those who believe like, you know, culture's crap and, you know, just get your job done. Mm -hmm. I, I think at the essence, we have to know that as strategic as we try to be around locations and patients and treatment coordination and so forth, the entire infrastructure of dental and many other businesses are just a bunch of humans working together, mm -hmm. right? To, to get to an outcome. We don't necessarily have like a special software like Facebook, right? That's running algorithms and helping us generate income you know, you could argue even in those businesses is a bunch of humans who have to do the programming and everything yeah. else, but especially in healthcare, the culture is really the operating system by which all of us know how to behave, especially when the boss isn't there anymore. I think for most people, the reason they don't have to worry about culture is if you've got a big personality and your entire operation is in four walls, when you show up every day, you're setting the culture. Yeah. Right. Everyone. Know, okay. Dr. Emmett's coming in. Right. And this is, Oh, he's in a good mood. Okay, great. We're going to behave like the, Oh, he's in a bad mood. Everyone knows how to behave around that. That yeah. kind of is defining the culture. When you get into scaling and you're in multiple locations and you can't influence that, you have to be very proactive about who are we, why are we doing what we're doing so that people know how to show up every day and how yeah, to behave it. with one another. And think about, just from a, like a therapy perspective, how many family, everyone just came out of Thanksgiving, right? It was like, you know, all these, and that's your own family coming yeah. together. Think of all these multiple families all in a practice with, you know, what, how they think being friendly is in their family versus this one thinks being friendly is. You <laughs> or know? being so, friendly in California versus being friendly in New Jersey. You know what I mean? Exactly. So how yeah. do you bring that all together? I think that's why culture and focusing on it is so important. And if you're not focused on it, you still have one, right? It's not mm -hmm. like yeah. culture just goes away. It's just, yeah. you're not controlling it proactively. 
So, so one of the key words you said is why we're doing this, right? Like what's the why behind what we're doing is what, I, do you guys rally around that as a culture or what do you rally around? How are you rallying? Yeah, we're revolutionizing dental care by taking care of underserved patients and creating an amazing doctor staff and patient experience. So for us really rallying around the underserved markets is important to us. I, I think if, you know, if I was giving someone some advice maybe a couple resources to go create culture would be um, Patrick Lencioni's book, uh, The Advantage. He's got like six questions. And what I really like is he's not big into vision mission statements. He just says, just create a mantra that everyone can remember and utilize. Mm. And now every department's created a mantra under our umbrella mantra. I, I think his questionnaire, his six questions, super simple quick way to get there and say, okay, why do we exist? Who are we trying to serve? You know, wh what's the impact we want to have and just make sure that that can't be misunderstood. That's awesome. What, what Emmett, what would be one, um, thing if you were to take a job, any job in your company, um, what would that job be if you had to stay there forever and you couldn't be, couldn't be the position that you currently have? So I, I have to throw in a little philosophy here. I, I love Dan Sullivan's concept that entrepreneurs do not retire because retire <laughs> means to be put out of service. Mm -hmm. Entrepreneurs, great entrepreneurs are constantly retiring from activities that no longer serve them. Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm constantly working towards, okay, I should retire from that. Like maybe I'm good at it. Maybe I hate it right? Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm terrible at it, but I'm the only one that can do that. So I'm, I'm, and, and a lot of times what I use, you know, people will say, what's the executive I should hire? Wherever you're feeling the most anxiety, that's what you should hire next, because that moves you to the next level of transformational leadership is if you can reduce your anxieties. So right now I'm, I'm in the position uh, that I love, which is continuing to promote the brand with our entrepreneur doctors. Hmm. So I, I love entrepreneurship. So internally and externally, I'm constantly looking for entrepreneur doctors and how to get them on our platform. Cause I believe there's a lot of doctors like us who've gotten their company to a certain level and they need a home depots and Lowe's yeah. and they don't want to do what we had to do, go through the dark tunnel of like hiring all this team, building out all these resources, having all these programmers, and then just, you know, dropping their net income and EBITDA down they'd rather like partner with a fellow entrepreneur and then scale the business. Got it. So walk, walk me through that. So what's the difference between these entrepreneur dentists versus the non-entrepreneur dentists? And then what, what is your day-to-day -day of serving those entrepreneur dentists and partnering with them look like for you? So um, an entrepreneur versus non-entrepreneur, I mean, in fairness, we would say any dentist who owns a practice would say they were entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. I specifically um, define it as my vision is bigger than my team. So someone who's like, man, I have this other impact I want to have, but my current team doesn't serve them. So if you're a dentist who's like, I've got a great practice, I'm really happy. I'm taking out my money. I'm investing in other places. And like, this is perfect. And I don't need to move. I I'm probably not your best fit. You know, and when you go to retire, like there's great DSOs out there that really take on like the retiring doc transition. Yep. Yep. That's, that's not me. Got it. I'm the one that's like, Hey, I, I've been trying to build another location. I'm trying to do this. I see this opportunity, but to get there, I'd need this team member and this, and I'd have to build out this resource if I could just have it, but I want to still do it my way. I still want to have like the impact I want to have. Like I've got a certain patient avatar I'm taking care of. I don't want that to get standardized or diluted over here, here, and here. I even have like a, spe a specific culture that I want to enhance, not dilute. That's really interesting to me because then I can be the homes, uh, uh, Home Depot and Lowe's for them, mm -hmm. right? Give them the resources they need. Give them the team members that they need to scale and grow that vision. And, you know, we talk about dental, like it's one patient type, one customer <laughs> yeah. type. There's so many different customers from, from geriatric high end to pediatric Medicaid and everything in between. So to me, what's really interesting is seeing these entrepreneur dentists who figured out how to take care of a certain patient type, 
but then they can't scale it quite as far as sometimes that's at three locations. Sometimes that's at 15. They just mm -hmm. hit a wall. Yeah. So working with them to like define their next part of their vision, what resources they need, and then providing those. I mean, that's fascinating. When you're working with entrepreneurs, like you're having exponential impact. Yeah. That's awesome. What are some of the biggest walls that you're seeing people hit right now that you're, that, that are stopping them in their tracks and having them come start talking with you? Um, yeah, great, great question. Um, the first one is the complexity that we've been living under as business owners is insane. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, absolutely insane. I, I actually appreciate why in other countries that don't have democratic processes, why it's so hard to be an entrepreneur, because when the government platform is moving so quickly on its mandates and requirements or in other countries where there's a lot of bribery and other things, it's hard to get traction. Mm -hmm. right? It's hard to have enough stability. So we've all had to just deal with that based on a global pandemic, social justice movements, et cetera. And we're trying to lead out. Mm -hmm. And there's just so many fronts, you know, it's not that we're necessarily resistant. Some things we probably have an opinion on too, on, you know, the best way to, to handle those. And, um, that on top of, I'm trying to get my AR report or whatever else a business owner is trying to do out there is just overwhelming. And then you add in, you know, some of the employment issues when you're competing against the government for dollars, yeah. it's tough. So I, I think some of those, um, you know, one of the first chapters in my book is, are you sure you really want to be an entrepreneur? <laughs> this two years has really pushed people to ask that question. And the other part is every mm -hmm. entrepreneur, I'll, I'll go a little bit deep here. Every entrepreneur is an entrepreneur partly out of dysfunction out of the fact that there's something in their childhood and their life that they're running from. And there's a transitional point for all of us where we want to stop running um, from something and we want to start running to something. And when that happens, we get more open to partnering because we mm -hmm. get real specific. I'm like, I don't need to prove anything to the world. I've done that. Now I just want to have specific impact. And with the right partners, you can do that better. I love that. I've heard you say on some other podcast about how America has a lot of entrepreneurs more so than other countries. And a, part of it is because you, people were running from the oppressive governments of other countries, right? And running to America. So you got all the entrepreneur blood and spirit and, and mindset all well, built and out. Think about 17, 1800s, only the ADD people were getting on boats <laughs> going across an ocean. You yep. know? I mean, yep. you probably look at our DNA, right? And it's like, yeah, you guys have different DNA because yep. your ancestors were all the ADD. Be like, get on a boat. It might crash and drown. Okay. That sounds fun. Let's do it. You know? Yeah. And then everybody had to start businesses, right? Like you, you started a farm and like, but then eventually you were trading. And so everybody was like a ground level entrepreneur. So I, you, you I love see it today. I mean, the, the immigrants that come with their two suitcases, very limited and they build from scratch. I mean, some of the best entrepreneurs out there. That's awesome. So what are, so, so what are some of the, I, I know doctors, when I talk to doctors, they, they, they like the tactical side of things. So what, if, if a doctor comes to you, they say, Hey, I want to work with you, but my systems are broken. How do you help them implement systems into their organization? So the first thing is we're going to prioritize where is it that they're really feeling the most anxiety and pain. Um, I think what they're most concerned about again is some big company is going to come in and try to standardize a bunch of stuff, which is really dumb because then you throw out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah. So step one is I got to get clear on like what's, what's their vision, which frankly, Gary, because they've had constraints, when I remove all those constraints, it does create a little bit of career crisis for them, <laughs> which all of us have gone through, but it's almost yeah. like, wait, 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 if I have funding, if that billing thing's solved, if this operation, if that HR person, if compliance is getting taken care of, <laughs> what, you know, where do I want to go next? Like the sky's the limit. Um, having the world at your feet can sometimes, you know, create a lot of like self analysis. So just kind of sitting with them in that, um, and, and a little bit of booing them up because, you know, we don't think of it as entrepreneurs because we complain about the constraints a lot, but those constraints give us a little bit of our need to be needed. Mm -hmm. And you see that even in entrepreneurs who have a hard time delegating generally, like yep. 
the dentist who's like, but if a hygienist came in, what would I do? You know, yeah. there, there is a little bit of need to be needed. Well, this is a much higher level. So I think a lot of the work is helping define that next level of contribution with them. We, we don't realize how much that holds all of us back is we just don't, as visionary as we are, sometimes we don't see ourselves at the next level. Um, and the other thing, Gary, that's really hard as, as an entrepreneur, as you move up, the way you contribute becomes less tangible. Mm -hmm. If you think about transformational leaders, they're not like, oh man, his billing process is amazing, <laughs> right? It's the way he shows up, sets the vision, helps people work mm -hmm. through their mental blocks. So if you think about that, leading becomes more and more our capability to connect with humans. Mm -hmm. And, and, and set, and set other people us. up, right? Set other people up for success. That's the biggest thing that I've noticed is that it, I can, I can be successful in this one little thing. And, you know, if I'm a dentist, I can do fillings really well or implants really well. And that's great. And everybody knows that. And it's very clear, but can I teach 10 other doctors to actually be better than me in that category and to have that vision for themselves and carry that out? That's way harder to do. And it creates like what you're creating, what I'm hearing is you're creating, uh, um, some, some footsteps to help people get traction, to be able to do that. And that, yeah, I, I I'll think give that's you amazing. One hack on that, by the way, cause that is really common. You know, have you ever taken like your best person and said, Hey, I want to make you manager. And mm -hmm. then they show up and they say, all right, guys, here's how you do it. Yeah. You're going to work hard. You're going to learn all this stuff and that's how I got here. So good luck. You know, yep. you're like, yeah, I was looking for a little more mentorship than that. Part of the problem is some of us, a type personalities, hard workers, we've built a lot of our capability through int intuitive experience. Mm -hmm. How do you download that? Like when someone says, Hey Emmett, how do you lead? You know, it's like asking me, so how do you breathe? I don't know. I suck in and I blow out, you know? They need more detail than that. What I'll do is I'll take somebody, they frankly don't have to have a lot of experience. They just need to be like a good observer. And I'll say, let's say I have a great doc whose chair side's got this scripting and for some reason their treatment coordination's amazing. And I say, why is your treatment coordination? I don't know, because I take care of patients. You know, you'll take like someone with a project management title or maybe just an admin title and say, I want you to just follow this doc and listen to what he says. Pretty soon what you'll see is there's patterns to their success. And hey doc, every time, you know, mom does this, you always do this. Why is that? It'll start unraveling this great intuition. Mm -hmm. And then you can build that into processes and checklists. So there's a tactical item, Gary, if like you're having a hard time training associates, have somebody follow you. You'll find that you're activities aren't quite as customized as you thought they were. They're actually mm -hmm. very pattern based mm -hmm. and you're constantly refining them for better outcomes, but there is a pattern in there that you can yep. actually train other people on. I love that. And, and yeah, the, when doctors get stuck in, I've seen this personally inside of organizations where they'll have like three, four practices. Right. And, but every, but they're not a DSO, right. They don't want to be a DSO and everybody's in the practice working on dentistry. And then everybody's fractional CEO, fractional CFO, fractional everything, right? And it and it there's nobody focusing on the business. And I know one of the things that you guys at full time, I should say, they're not focusing on the business full time. And one of the things that I know you guys use is project managers. What would you tell somebody from a because you just kind of alluded right there? The project manager would need to sit and listen and document. So you have to have mental space. It can't be the hygienist because she's cleaning teeth doing it, right? So yep. how would you, if someone was at that stage, they're at that four practice, five practice stage, how, like, what's that next hire? Is it a project manager or is it that you want to start thinking about executive level stuff or is it just deciding to get out of the chair? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? So one of the big friction points in any entrepreneur business is you tend to have people who are making things up the innovative side. And you have people down here who are making things reoccurring, right? They're doing the day-to-day -day activity to keep the business going. They have huge friction points with each other. You need someone in the middle who makes it real. 
So you got make it up, make it real, make it reoccurring. These are critical layers to have in place. So if you go, man, you know, I came up with this brilliant idea and the person's like, I don't have time for that. Well, that's because you're interacting with a reoccurring person. They don't even want the icons on their screen to change, right? Nothing should change in their life because they need it. You need someone in the middle who's going to take your whiteboard idea and figure out where the friction points of integration or implementation are going to be and then create the path for transition. And I think that's often missing. And then people go, man, I bought this scanner. We never got it implemented. I bought this. I did this. I, I had this cool idea. I had a meeting with the team and I wrote it on the whiteboard and no one's done it. <laughs> you know, those kind of scripting means you've got make it up, trying to interact with reoccurring. And in fairness to them, you finish writing it on the whiteboard, the phone starts ringing and day starts. If you don't have someone who's like, hey, my core job is to help implement these concepts. And I've talked about this before. It's, it's in the book as well as dope. You need to document, organize, prioritize, and then execute. Because frankly, what happens to a lot of us is I've got a great idea today. I've got another one tomorrow. Got, and the team doesn't know which one I'm supposed to be working on. So they do what smart humans do. They don't do anything because they just wait for me to come up with the next idea. You know? Yeah, <laughs> like, yep. yeah, I was going to work on that, but I think in about an hour you'll have another idea. So I'm just going to hold off. <laughs> you know, that's awesome. Yeah, I have that. I have that problem as well. Um, so I'm going to change gears on you a little bit. So um, obviously, right now people are um, wanting to grow. We have a shortage of staffing, right? Um, how are you walking through that and solving that, and how or helping the people that you're working through with uh, solve that? One of the most confusing things happened uh, because of accounting. They, When they do profit and loss statements, they took employees and they put them as an expense and they took our chairs and they put them as assets on a balance sheet, right? We, we really should be thinking about our employees like customers. Mm -hmm. Same exact strategy we do to attract and retain customers, i.e. marketing and sales process. We call it recruiting and onboarding, but it's really just another name for the same activity. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, even before COVID, if you've got a CRM for customers, why wouldn't you have a CRM for recruiting? Um, if you've got a website for customers, mm -hmm. why wouldn't you have a website for recruiting? If you've got this great brochure for customers, why wouldn't you have a great brochure for Recruited. And sometimes people say, well, I'm not going to treat them like customers. I mean, I pay them a salary, but you pay them a salary to produce income for you. Right. Yeah. I mean, yep. let's not, you're not paying them a salary because this is like a charitable contribution. <laughs> yeah. So the goal is to, you know, make them raving fans just as you want patients to be. And I think we got behind the eight ball um, in a lot of companies that way. And so we're having to retool our mindset. So the first thing I would do if someone says, I'm having a, a hard time recruiting people, I definitely say, how clear are you about who you are and who you want to be? Because nobody right now wants to come into something where it's like, I don't know what we're doing or why we're here. You know, just get to work. Like, you're just not going to be able to get quality people. They, they yeah. want more than that. And then number two, like, how good is your marketing out to the employee market? If I, I if I like went to your website right now, would I want to work for you? Yeah. So if I'm, if I have four practices and I don't even have anything on there about team members, uh, I'm in trouble, right? Like, uh, yeah, I'm not even ready to start marketing to team members if I'm all patient facing. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be tough in this, uh, market. So you're definitely going to want to step back. Now I, I start with the easiest thing of like, okay, maybe I just build a sheet that yeah. I can give to all my employees and say, why do you love working here? Let's put that all together. Great. Can you hand this out to friends and family? Yeah. Right? The, yep. the other thing I think, Gary, I, I see dentists get caught up on like, I need an RDA who has 10 years of experience <laughs> and fits my culture perfectly. Right. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten no applications or I've gotten five applications and they were all terrible. I, I call it hunting for unicorns. Yeah. We get so idealistic to me, you know, I'm more reduced down to, I need a good culture fit and I'll just train all the other tactical yeah. stuff. You know? So put the pressure more on you. You just want the culture fit and then put the pressure on you to get them up to the skill level that you need to get them to. Which is 
pressure I would much prefer mm -hmm. over someone who has great skill set and bad culture fit. Mm -hmm. I mean, they'll yep. blow up the entire company, right? So, yeah. Yeah. I see this. I see this in the like the hygienist market right now, right? So it's like hygienists want to work part time, but a lot of people don't want to have part time hygienists because it's more complicated for their business. So you're you someone's going to have to give here, right? And totally. um, if you need those team members to scale, then you got to kind of change your business model. Speaking of business model, so de novo versus acquisition. What's the pros and cons from your from your business side for the way that you look at those two different business? Yeah, models? I have a pretty strong opinion about this. Those who can do de novos have a more solid business model. Now, having done both, I, I don't want the acquisitions to think I'm disparaging them. Mm -hmm. But the reality is to do a de novo, I have to understand the marketplace, the, the retail. I have to understand how to acquire patients, how to get it up and running. The financing's more complicated, et cetera. But that is a more solid capability because now the sky's the limit. I mean, as many patients as there are out there, if you know how to tap them, you can kind of drill oil wells wherever mm -hmm. you want, right? Mm -hmm. The acquisition mark, the, the difficult thing with de novos is banks don't understand them. It doesn't matter how many you've done. And so it can be very difficult in the beginning to get any funding for them. You know, you go into a bank, you say, I've got this brilliant idea. I've done it a couple of times. Um, give me a bunch of money. We'll have zero income for, you know, this amount of time. So that's the difficult part. Acquisitions, much easier to get financing. Hey, they've got current revenue, current fund, you know, but now I've got to bring these different cultures together. I have to figure out um, what is it that I'm consolidating together? How am I supporting them? How, how am I not? And so it's a different checklist of items uh, to, to have capability around. So. Got him. All right. Um, changing gears on you one more time. So obviously you're helping, you've helped in the past, you've helped entrepreneurs move over to that C-suite. And I think that's a huge opportunity inside of dentistry right now. What are you doing to help elevate the C-suite that maybe you're working with or you're working with these other uh, partners that you're bringing up and they're saying, hey, I need a CEO, I need to become a better CEO, or I need, I have a CFO, but they need to become a better CFO. What are you focusing on first to really elevate that C, the C-suite? Well, I, I think, let me see if I'm answering this right. Are you saying like an entrepreneur who's trying to scale or a yeah, CFO no, so, who's so assuming to, let, to the next level? Yeah, the, the, the C-suite's already there. So what, what are we doing to help them get better in the, in the dental space specifically? it's really no different than what I do for myself. Where's their primary anxieties? Mm -hmm. You know, it, where's your CFO really feeling overwhelmed? And what you're getting the feeling of, uh, Gary, is my culture, which is humility is our first pillar. Mm -hmm. I, I need people who can be vulnerable because that's the only way we provide massive support. Yep. If you get into like this corporate politics, blaming others, not showing your weaknesses, I actually don't know how to help you. Yeah. Um, and neither does the rest of the team. So I think one of the most powerful things you can build into your culture is people who are willing to admit where their anxieties, vulnerabilities, lack of capabilities are. Because what they'll notice is if you've got a good culture is a massive amount of support and resources come to, um, to help you. Listen, if, if Ken Kaufman comes to me and says, I'm really struggling here, here, and here, can you help me? Do you really think I'm going to be like, well, I'll just get another CFO. <laughs> you know, it's like, that is but ridiculous. that has to be fostered right? from the top down, right? So the, to your point, that atmosphere has to be fostered. And that comes from, that comes from having, um, trust and healthy conflict and being able to work through those things. And, and, if you don't have that, then it's like, to your point, it's really hard to help that. So I, I love that answer. That's spot I, I on. do think Kim Scott's book, Radical Candor is mm -hmm. very helpful for CEOs to be better communicators. Some of us just aren't assertive enough um, in our communication. Some of us are pretty jerky. We've read mm -hmm. too many Steve Jobs books, you know, um, <laughs> so we need to figure out the right way to be able to push our team and say, hey, I noticed you're you're not succeeding here. How can I support you? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, where they feel like I appreciate you exposing me and I actually appreciate the help Yeah. rather than, wow, this scares me. You know? mm, I love that. Um, okay. So 
what are your thoughts about some of these dental practices potentially going public? Um, and maybe someday other, you know, if you're, I don't know where you're at with that, where mentally, what do you think of that? Is that a good thing, a bad thing? Um, you know, it's a financing solution, right? I think this industry has gotten a little caught up on like private equity and going public and so forth. I mean, it's like having an opinion of bank of America versus Wells Fargo <laughs> versus it's, it's a financing solution that if it fulfills the in, helping you fund the impact that mm -hmm. you're trying to have and your impact is, is done well, mm -hmm. then I think it's fabulous. You know, it's, it's going to put a lot of um, pressure on those companies, of course, being in public markets, you know, the challenge, whether you're Amazon, Apple, Google, or a dental company is public markets look at your finances quarterly. Mm. And, and, you know, the best companies have kind of figured out a way to say, screw you financial markets. I'm taking a long-term perspective, <laughs> Yeah, but it takes a certain level of strength and capability to do that the right way, you mm. know? Um, and again, you've seen Amazon say, I'm not going to be profitable, but I'm going to reinvest and I'm playing a long-term game. And if you want to join, great. But is that, that is that feasible in dental though? Right. Yeah. And you have to have a special leader and then you have to be an innovator in something that's never been done before. Right. So is it that, that would be tricky to do in dental. Um, and I know that you have a lot of opinions because you have a financial background, kind of where the dental industry from, is from a financial side of things. And you have to have your ducks in a row to go public. What, what, are, where do you kind of see the dental industry from that financial lens right now? I think the other challenging thing is in our general budgeting, if I'm selling a widget and I go out to my sales guys and say, we got to hit 10% more growth and here's the markets and here's what I want to see in activity. I can do a certain amount of pressure to make that happen. D dentistry doesn't work that way, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. like to, to be the CEO of a DSO is really to go to our clinical director and say, so what do you think this year we're going to do? And, how, you know, what's the patient type that we're seeing? And what do you think's reasonable? Because you do have to do a level of budgeting, right? Yeah. You got to yeah. be able to afford the machines and the payroll and so forth. But it's just not the same. So I know other healthcare companies have gone public. I'm, I'm excited to see it. I think it opens the door to others who want to have bigger impact to say, oh, okay, great. That path has been trod. And mm -hmm. now I don't have to wonder if it's good or bad. I'll just be able to see if it's good or it's bad. That's great. Um, what's your 10 year vision look like for what you're trying to build? My ideal would be to continue to attract entrepreneur clinicians and provide them the resources to have as big an impact as they can. There's just so much opportunity and dental. And I mean that on multiple layers, 40% of people go to the dentist regularly. That means if we could get it to 80%, we double the entire industry, <laughs> which is crazy. So Just that point alone is types. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many patient types that need services. Everyone doesn't need to be hiring a CFO, a COO, you know, all these different things. If I can just give them those resources, how much money do we save for everybody? Right. And then allow them. Most of us got into this. We were excited about having impact with our patients and staff. We weren't as excited to like build out a software development team, a call center, a billing team. You know, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. It's like the teenager who likes, you know, a cigarette. And then his dad puts like 10 cigarettes in his mouth and lights them all. Sometimes as an entrepreneur, it's like, oh, I really <laughs> like learning this. Oh crap. I don't want to learn all, you know, everything that's required. So if, if I can clear a path where these entrepreneurs feel like they're getting massive support, but it's not ruining the vision they have, like that would be really fun. That's awesome. What, what is one skill or capability that you're working on for yourself right now? You're trying to get better at. Um, now it, it is around like, I'm getting around higher and higher level entrepreneurs. We've gone through several mergers and just being the right leader for them. Um, some of them are really strong on, let's say, expense management, and they've built a great organization doing that. Others are very like abundance mindset and marketing strategy. We're all partners now making equity decisions together. Mm. 
how do you bridge the gap at that high of a level of conversation where you've got good culture fits, but you have different ways to approach. Yeah. Um, and there's not a wrong, they're not wrong, right? It's not like you're wrong and they're no. right. But it's, so what do you, so how are you solving that? I'm curious, uh, like what are, what are you working through to get better at that? The majority is, um, just getting us all more self-aware on the reality. Like it's very easy, as you know, Gary, to just get in your mindset that your way is right. Cause it's been successful mm -hmm. to the extent that we all can see that our, sh our weaknesses are simply the overuse of our strengths. Mm -hmm. So if I can identify my strengths, I got a pretty good indication of where my weaknesses are. If we're all transparent, we could actually leverage off of each other to be like, Hey, I tend to be overabundant a little bit, you know, give too much here. What do you think X, you know, uh, partner yeah. on how you would approach this? Great. Now, if you approach it that way, you probably really tick off this doctor cause that's a little stingy. So we really want their heart and, and brain engaged, not just their hands and back. You, you see what I'm saying? So yeah, by totally. No. being transparent, you start to bridge the gap of the yep. best piece. I think most things are overcome by increasing transparency on both sides. Yep. I love that. I love that. Great stuff. You, uh, the listeners can hear why and understand why. I love listening to Emmett. Every time I hear you speak, Emmett, I'm learning, I'm growing. You're helping me personally. So thank you so much. So quick, quick question. Or is there anything that I forgot to ask you or anything that you would like to cover? I know your book, you have your book. If you haven't got this book and you're in the dental industry, um, huge mistake. So DSO secrets, obviously you have the group. Um, is there yeah, anything on else? Amazon, by the way, DSO secrets on Facebook, you know, I've heard people now it's been there, uh, for a few years, people can just go on and like search stuff. And, uh, if they search marketing, they'll see some great stuff Gary said. Um, but it's really becoming a resource. A, a couple points, maybe I'd say Gary, that I think mindset wise, one, you said a lot of people don't want to be a DSO. I understand why they say that because they associate it with corporate and they don't mm -hmm. want to be a corporation. I, I would challenge it, say, do you want to be a dental support organization? The moment you hire an associate, that associate <laughs> wants you to support them. Yep. So go ahead and embrace at least the mindset of support. The The new associate doesn't want to do your marketing strategy, figure out where your router <laughs> is supposed to be, point. take care yeah. of your front desk HR issues, right? Yep. So. Frankly, you are a DSO, you know, if you're doing it right or you're not keeping associates, one of the yep. two, the number two is like, when I get lost with everything going on, my North star is how can I take care of the customer better? And, and if I can identify that, and sometimes the customer is the patient, sometimes I'm like, no, that's going pretty good. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's the doctor. No, that's going then it's the staff, then it's the team around me. So if I kind of use that as my constraint um, analysis model, then I know that I've are, you know, I'm always focused on the right things. That's awesome. Yeah. I was taught when I came in the dental industry and I started working with single practitioners. I didn't work with any groups. I didn't even work with anybody who had two locations. DSOs are evil, right? Like they're just the worst thing. They're going to destroy dentistry. And then when I got exposed to you and several others in, in the industry, it was like, well, no, there's good single practitioners. There's bad single location practitioners. There's great DSOs and there's bad DSOs. It's just like anything else. So, um, and I think you um, are a great spokesman and uh, um, just doing a great job of really breaking these things down. Okay, fun hey, question. There is a chapter that says, don't build an evil DSO. Um, and so I, uh, I even lay out, and it's really not that hard not to, because frankly, if you are building a bad one, I hope the dentists are good enough to walk away from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard you one time say, uh, only dentists can build an evil DSO, right? Because we're entrepreneurs don't know dentistry enough to be able to go in and manipulate all of those kind of things. Well, and, and the dentist can walk away from us and kick us out of the industry, right? Yep. I mean, and the majority of states, you can't own a dental practice. So if they want you out, you're done. Yeah. Uh, the only one who can stay in is another dentist, right? So yeah, I, I think um, dentists have a lot more control and this is going to be really exciting for them. That's awesome. I love it. Um, what is your most impactful marketing campaign that you've ever had on yourself personally? 
Um, not, not talking about inside your business to generate new patients, but something like Apple, uh, or something that Peloton or something like that. Oh yeah. Like the, the, the one that, um, to me was really interesting is when Apple did the contrast with Microsoft and they mm -hmm. had the two guys, yeah. right. And, um, I, I thought it was just so well done to create contrast. And I think one of the things we can, sometimes people get caught up on their competitor. So I wouldn't take that away from it. Yeah. Um, what I think most of us need though, as adults is we need better contrast. If I didn't get this treatment done, what happens, mm -hmm. right? Some of that contrast isn't given to us. It's just kind of, here's where you're at. So yeah, I like, um, I like marketing that says, here's the problem. Here's the solution. And by the way, here's what happens if you don't solve it. I love that. And then where, where can people find you? I mean, if someone wants to reach out with you and learn more about what you, all the awesome stuff you guys are doing, how can they find you? Yeah. The, the best places would definitely be uh, DSO secrets, Facebook page with DEO. Um, if they want to get even like more intimate coming over to dentist entrepreneur organization, We've got several um, summits and events and programs there. Um, they want to grab a book. It's now going to be on Audible here uh, soon, so you don't even have to read it. Um, anyway, yeah, happy to interact with them on any of those platforms. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Emmett, for coming on. Such great content. Super valuable. It's helped me. I know it's going to help everybody. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much, Gary.